Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our second day of our meeting. And it uh, gives me great pleasure today to focus this morning on, uh, in the, at least in the first presentation, on pediatric pain, something that's um, very close to my heart. Um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Rebecca Slater. Rebecca is an uh, associate professor of uh, pediatric neuroimaging. I like that, like there are many professors of pediatric neuroimaging. <laughs> But actually, she is the, one of the pioneers of this new field. Uh, she's been able to develop and actually uh, persuade people that it's possible to do this type of science. She's, um, as an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at University of Oxford. She's a welcome fellow. She was uh, the first person to demonstrate that it's possible to neuroimage neonates. And uh, much of her work has been in demonstrating what the effect of um, early injury and insult can be uh, later in life and on, on the newborns and on children. Now, one of the nice things about uh, Rebecca, as you'll come to understand, is that she works in a field that is not short of opinion. There are many people who have very strong opinions about uh, pain in, your, in young people, but she manages to bring a calm, and a scientific approach to help us to see light instead of just feel the heat of that debate. And as such, she has been uh, almost developing a, a sort of alternative career in being an expert science communicator. So I can think of nobody better to introduce our second day than Rebecca Slater. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and many thanks to the organisers for giving me this opportunity. I'm very pleased I made it here today because I'm nearly eight months pregnant, so I was thinking it might be a bit touch and go over the last few weeks. But now I'm going to talk to you about pain in infancy, and I have nothing to disclose. So pain in infancy is a really important clinical issue. In the UK and much of Western Europe, about 15% of babies who are born will require some kind of special care or intensive care. And if these babies require intensive care, then on average, they'll experience about 10 painful procedures per day. But indeed, the youngest and the sickest infants will experience up to 50 painful procedures a day. So this is a very high load of nociceptive input in a vulnerable and developing nervous system. So when these procedures take place, most commonly, analgesia is not provided. And very simply put, because babies cannot talk, we need to find other ways to measure pain in this population. So where is pain management lie at the moment from a clinical perspective? Well, in the UK, and indeed this is um, represented in other countries too, only around 25% of neonatal units have a pain management guideline in place. And when we start thinking about acute pain, in fact, more than 65% of the units don't have um, pain management guidelines. And because of this, analgesia is rarely provided, and this paper um, that was um, done in France suggested that it was only around 35% of the cases where anything would be given. But indeed, when I say analgesia in this context, I don't mean um, pharmacological analgesia. It included other comfort measures like talking to the baby and swaddling the baby. So many procedures are performed in these children, even though in older children or in adults, um, pain relief would be given. And just um, one example, this is um, a relatively old um, study now, but they demonstrated that when infants were being intubated, um, pre-medication was provided in less than 50% of the time. So why has this... Um, this happened, and there's a number of reasons, and these were beautifully summarized in um, a history of um, this area, written by Rebecca Riddell and colleagues. And what they showed is that for many years, it was simply thought that babies do not feel pain. 
They were thought to have a very immature nervous system and therefore incapable of actually processing the nociceptive stimuli. And the inability for a baby to remember pain was in some ways equated to a lack of experience. And um, because they were unable to talk, the assumption was that they couldn't experience pain at all. And consequently, a long time ago now, sort of 30, 40 years ago, um, surgery and other procedures were performed without adequate analgesia and often um, just with muscle, with muscle relaxants. Now, this practice has changed, but still, when we're talking about the acute procedures that these children experience frequently, um, it lagged behind pain management in other populations. So how can we measure pain in babies? And I've got some examples on this slide. So most commonly, um, looking at change in facial expression is used. And this is because babies can cry and grimace when um, they experience noxious events. But you can also look at um, respiratory responses or cardiovascular responses, looking at ECG recordings or respiration rate. Um, other measures that have been used have looked at reflex withdrawal of the stimulated limb. But the work I'm going to focus on today is looking at what happens in the infant brain. And so I'm going to describe a number of techniques, including fMRI, some near-infrared spectroscopy, and EEG, which have been used to try and look at the cortical activity um, that is evoked when infants experience pain. And the reason for this is that in the absence of language, it might be one of the best ways of understanding the experience compared to perhaps some of the behavioral or physiological measures that might not be directly equated with the experience of pain. So my work really started back in 2006 and what we wanted to do is see whether if a baby experienced a nociceptive input, and in this case, it was a clinically required heel lance, whether this information was transmitted through the peripheral and central nervous system to the brain. So we used near-infrared spectroscopy and simply looked at the left and right somatosensory cortex to see whether a change of um, activity could be recorded. Um, for those that are not familiar with this technique, it's a hemodynamic response, so it's similar in some ways to fMRI, but a little more simple to do um, because the baby can remain in the neonatal unit. And what we were able to show is if you stimulate the left foot, then you had an increase in activity in the contralateral somatosensory cortex in the term infants. But what happens when we looked at the youngest infants that are born, and um, in the neonatal unit, this could be from around 24 weeks gestation, which is not that long over um, halfway through a normal pregnancy. And we were able to show that even in these infants, they had a clear and significant response that was, um, you could see above the baseline. Um, so all the children that were included in this study um, demonstrated that the information was being transmitted to the brain. So this was well and good, it was interesting to demonstrate it, but how did it compare to the current clinical pain scales that were used in clinical practice? And so what we looked at was correlating the brain activity with the um, change in facial expression scores that would be the most um, frequently used clinical indicator of pain. And not surprisingly, the correlation was pretty good. So the more activity that we recorded in the brain, um, it seemed that they had um, more facial grimacing. But this study highlighted a really important point because about 40% of the children didn't demonstrate any change in facial expression. And this is consistent with many other studies that have shown this. However, nearly 80% of the children that didn't have a facial expression still showed this significant increase in brain activity. 
And so this suggested if you were just using behavior alone, then you might underestimate the um, pain experience. And actually, some more recent work that we've done, we're looking at children who are septic or those that have other um, comorbidities, um, they seem to demonstrate much less facial expression changes, which perhaps isn't that surprising because um, the children are, could be more tired and it's quite de energetically demanding in order to mount these responses that if you're unwell, there might be um, a predisposition to have a reduced behavioural response. So having looked at the hemodynamic response, I then wanted to go on and see what was actually happening from an electrophysiological point of view. And some of the advantages of transferring to this technique was that we had better coverage of the brain. So in the previous studies I described, we only looked at two source and detector pairs, whereas here we could put sort of an array of maybe 16 electrodes over the head and we could look at the underlying changes in the neural activity. And what we're able to find is that at around 500 milliseconds after the stimulus, there was a specific pattern of activity that was only generated in response to a noxious event. So if a high intensity visual stimulus or an auditory stimulus or indeed a um, tactile event was applied, you had an earlier pattern of activity at around 200 milliseconds, which is represented as a, a deflection on this slide. But only in the event that something was noxious did we have this large deflection um, at around 500 milliseconds. And these techniques have been used now to answer a number of questions about um, the development of pain in babies and indeed some very important clinical questions about the effectiveness of analgesics. So here is um, one example. And what we were able to do is take two populations of children some healthy term babies that were experiencing the first noxious procedure that, um, after birth, and then a group of preterm babies who had been in intensive care for at least 40 days and now were equivalent in age to the term babies. We did some tactile stimulation and noxious stimulation. And in response to the tactile stimulation, we were able to show that the two populations of children um, didn't have any differences in terms of their responses, which was very positive because it meant that being born prematurely didn't necessarily alter all of um, the somatosensory um, input. However, when we looked at their responses to the noxious stimulation, the response was um, significantly greater in the children who had born preterm. Now, we can't say this is because they experienced a lot of pain per se, because the, these children have a very different experience to the healthy term children. But something about the period of um, intensive care that they had received was specifically altering the way they responded to the noxious stimulation. So the next question that we wanted to ask is how do these responses change and mature through this early developmental period when there were large structural and functional changes taking place? Well, I hope I've convinced you that in the term infants, that in response to touch, there was this early pattern of specific um, sensory activity and following the noxious stimulation, there was this nociceptive specific uh, activity that can be recorded. So what about the extreme, extremely preterm children? Well, in response to the noxious, non-noxious stimulation, it was well known that this will activate a generic burst of activity across the brain. And this is called a delta brush for those that are familiar um, with sort of looking at EEGs. So what happened to the noxious stimulation?
Did it um, have a generic burst of activity similar to the non-noxious, or had this specific pattern already emerged? And to cut a long story short, the answer is that in the youngest infants, following noxious stimulation, they also um, generated a generic burst of activity that couldn't be differentiated um, by that which is evoked by other sensory non-noxious stimulation. And the next graph simply summarizes this. This graph shows the emergence of the non-noxious um, generic activity um, that was evoked, and you can see in the youngest babies, um, the non-specific activity generally happens around getting towards 100% of the time, but by their term, this is almost entirely gone. And actually, this is, perhaps would be expected because these generic bursts can also be seen um, when you're looking at spontaneous activity, and so um, they, they have disappeared by that date. But in contrast, it was at around um, 35 weeks where you were more likely to get these specific patterns. So this question is quite a basic developmental question, but how can these be used in order to look at um, analgesic efficacy? And so one of the things we're able to do is to see whether the administration of sucrose altered these patterns of activity. And the reason for doing this is that more than 100 randomized control trials have demonstrated that sucrose um, is an effective analgesic. Um, however, um, and it's the most frequently administered analgesic um, in neonatal care. So a basic randomized trial was done where 30 infants were randomized to get water and placebo. And all the measures I've been describing um, were undertaken in these populations. And fortunately, along with all the other 100 RCTs, we were able to show that the behavioral response was reduced. But in fact, the nociceptive brain and spinal cord activity were not altered by the administration of the sucrose. So the graphs here are really just demonstrating that the sucrose doesn't change the evoked potentials I've described or the reflex withdrawal recorded from the biceps femoris of the stimulated limb. And so, this just shows that how these techniques can be used, and in keeping within the theme of this meeting, how quickly some measures that were developed in 2006 were already translated into some kind of clinical utility by 2010, which is an incredibly short period for a field to develop so quickly. But one of the challenges of all of the studies I've described so far is um, a really big reliance on using clinical stimulation, such as cannulations, heel lances, um, and injections. And the challenge of this is that it's difficult to systematically characterize the relationship between the stimulus response features, such as it does this activity intensity encode or sensitize or habituate. So to do this, we wanted to see whether it was possible to use the pinprick stimulators that have classically been used in many adult studies and have been used in other neuropathic pain populations um, in babies. And the, we were, and one of the, what we were able to show is that if you used a relatively low intensity stimulus, and that was up to a maximum of 128 millinewtons, for those that are familiar with the device, um, it didn't generate a change in behavior or a physiological response. But we were able to record the reflex withdrawal activity. Um, and this slide just summarizes um, that result because when a train of 10 stimuli were applied with a brief interval between them, there was no difference in the clinical pain scores in the background following the first one or following the last one. However, importantly, they were graded in terms of the reflex withdrawal activity. So not surprisingly, the more intense the stimulus, the more we were able to see the withdrawal of the limb. 
This wasn't as um, at a, a level equivalent to the heel lance, um, which you can see is the, the highest response in this slide. And then the other question was, how did the brain activity compare? And again, the size of this response is also graded with stimulus intensity, but not, um, not close to the kind of activity you would get from the clinical intervention. And simply put, the fact that the reflex withdrawal was so directly correlated with the magnitude of brain activity um, suggested that looking at these reflex movements could be useful in, when considering a composite measure of pain which could be visually observed um, at the bedside. And just one other important feature is that in babies, there's no sign of habituation in either the reflex withdrawal or the um, evoked brain activity, which if you're familiar with doing these recordings in adults, um, you might expect to see. And this has some implications for um, clinical um, care. And when people are doing clustered care, repeating many stimuli seems like the babies respond every single time. So just to summarize the, this part of the talk, I've shown that EEG and near-infrared can be used to show that the information is transmitted to the brain. But still, any inferences about pain are necessarily um, based on these surrogate measures. And so one of the things that was, I wanted to do was to see whether we could use fMRI to actually identify some of the brain structures that are involved in generating these responses. And one of the advantages of this is clearly that these structures have been so well described in the adult population. Well, fMRI is the ideal technique to do this. And by um, preparing the infants carefully and using these pinprick stimulators, we wanted to compare the activity um, in the adult and the infant brain when they experience the same type of stimulation. And this is an example of a very comfortable looking infant in the MRI scanner. Clearly, if they weren't this relaxed, you wouldn't be able to do these studies. And so the stimulation wasn't causing um, massive body movements, although we could still see the reflex withdrawal of the foot. Um, the babies were generally asleep. The parents were often there helping to keep them asleep. And um, in fact, of the 20 or so studies we've done now, um, only one study was stopped because the baby was too restless for us to continue. Um, and this is just an example for those who are familiar with fMRI of one voxel in the somatosensory cortex showing that the model that we fitted and the changes observed were um, relatively well fit. So, in this um, sort of schematic where the activity is color coded according to the brain region that is active, what we can see is that the activity in the infant brain is very similar to that seen in the adult. In fact, 18 of the 20 brain regions that were activated in the adult, um, including many of the common structures that have been seen in other studies, were also active in the babies. And this included brain regions involved in both the sensory and effective processing of the stimuli. So we can see here in blue some of the anterior cingulate cortex that was active and some of the insula and other regions. So it was much more similar to the patterns of activity that you'd see in adults than I was originally um, expecting. But there were some differences. So for example, the amygdala um, was not active in the babies, and nor was the orbitary frontal cortex. And I'm not going to go into all the reasons about this today, um, but it's possible that the infant experience may differ in, in some ways to um, the adults. The other important point that came from this study was simply that the babies seemed to have more activity than the adults. 
So if you were to compare the highest stimulus used in the adult, which was about 500 millinewtons, with the stimulus in the baby, which was around 100, they were equivalent in terms of the changes in brain activity that were observed. Um, so rather than kind of taking this historical dogma that babies don't experience pain, it actually seems that they um, appear more sensitive in some of the studies demonstrated here. So fMRI can be used to look at nociceptive activity um, in the infant brain. Um, it can also be used to look at analgesic efficacy in the studies um, including sucrose that I've described. And what this suggests is that the infant is far more um, developed and may have a more similar experience to you and I that might have been originally thought. Um, one interesting direction where we might consider taking this study is looking at some of the similar approaches that have been used by Tor Vega and other colleagues in Oxford, where we can do some multivariate pattern analysis to try and define a neurological signature of the activity um, observed in the infant uh, brain. And this is um, some work that is ongoing at the moment. So finally, where is um, this work going? Well, I'm really excited to be able to say that we're about to start a large-scale randomized control trial looking at the efficacy of morphine in this population for procedural pain relief. So whereas sucrose is, has been considered to be highly efficacious, um, efficacious um, morphine is thought not to be very effective for pain relief in babies. And in fact, a, key, a recent Cochrane review does not recommend its use for um, procedural pain. And it's possible that um, this may be in part due to some of the study designs that have been used to address this question. For one, the outcome measures are not highly sensitive um, in the past, um, but also the morphine has generally been given for sedation in um, intubated babies. So in this study, um, a bolus dose of morphine will be given prior to um, quite a painful eye exam um, for retinopathy of prematurity, which is commonly performed to prevent blindness in this population and we'll be looking at a whole range of measures to see whether um, the morphine effectively reduces pain, but also improves the clinical stability after this procedure. So in fact, after babies currently undergo this procedure, where all of the current methods of pain relief are considered to be ineffective, the brief periods where babies stop breathing, um, known as apneas, increases from around a 20% chance of occurrence to nearly 50% chance of occurrence in the subsequent 24 hours. And one possibility is that if the pain was well managed during the procedure, then the clinical stability of these um, children will be um, improved. So the study started on 1st of September, and um, we've got about three years now before I'll be able to tell you whether, um, according to this work, um, morphine is effective. So this is my final slide where I just um, wanted to conclude with a, an interesting statement. I was writing a review, and I happily wrote, the predisposition to undertreat pain in infants still remains in clinical practice. And then I thought, oh, I probably should try and reference that, or at least check that it's true, and I'm not using references from 40 years ago. And so I had a look on NHS Choices, which is um, some guidelines for um, clinical treatment in the UK. And this was for tongue tie surgery. And the first thing it said was, in small babies, being cuddled and fed are more important than painkillers. I identified this in 2014, and then in 2015, just in time for this talk, they updated it and included this statement.
So clearly, we're, we still have some way to go to convince people that this is an important um, area and that some other strategies beyond um, the things suggested here are useful. And finally, it's just to say thank you to all the people involved in this work. Um, there's a huge um, range of people with a massive range of skills um, required to do these kind of studies because there's a huge amount of um, analysis all the way up to the clinical care of these children and these people have all um, been instrumental in doing this work. Thank you.